Hey there, and welcome to Radio Free Bay Ridge, your hyper-local progressive podcast centered exclusively on beautiful Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. I'm Dan. And I'm Rachel. And today we have a kind of a bittersweet little episode for you. Yeah. So we're going to be interviewing Reverend Robert Emmerich, who many progressives in the neighborhood may know if you were ever in any of the action groups for Fight Back Bay Ridge for the last what, Rachel, three, oh, four know. years at least? Well, I mean, we've wanted to talk to him since we started the podcast. Yeah. He donates the space, um, yeah. the Bay Ridge United Methodist Church. Yeah. And every meeting, you just kind of have Bob off in the corner, kind of watching everything, projecting his wonderful energy. <laughs> and then occasionally just coming in with like an amazing remark or mm-hmm. something that just brings everything back on track. Wait, are you implying activists get off track? <laughs> I, I believe I am. We, we often oh did, goodness. especially in those early days. And I think that a lot of progressives have quite a bit to owe Bob, but what you may not have known from him is that he does have a really rich history in Bay Ridge and some controversies that people may not have been aware of at all, and some really interesting decisions that he's made with his congregation. Mm -hmm. And today we want to focus on some of the things that Robert really finds important. Mm Mm-hmm. It's also kind of important to mention why we're doing this right now, and you get in a little bit into this in the interview, but sadly, the Reverend is leaving Bay Ridge. Yeah, he is agistly being booted out of his position. After a certain number of years, you just kind of are thrown into a forced retirement. Yep. Without giving it away, there's some really interesting insights that he has into that in the early part of the interview. We are going to touch on some of the things that I think progressives sometimes leave behind when Mm -hmm. it comes to morality and the religious left, which Mm -hmm. isn't a term you hear very often. It's not, but it's also an increasingly important to have people in faith roles and faith voters who are reaching out and who are creating welcoming spaces. And I think we're very, very lucky to have had that in Reverend Bob. For anyone who hasn't been in Fight Back Bay Ridge and is coming into this completely fresh, yes, Bay Ridge progressive politics has very much had an alliance and centered progressive, activist, religious groups in the neighborhood as well, and have used spiritual spaces across the spectrum, whether it is a mosque or a synagogue or a church, they have been key organizing spaces from the very beginning. And it's about time to really center those in the conversation and acknowledge the importance that they've had. And without further ado, let's go straight to Reverend Bob. All right. Number one, nice to be back in person. We've been doing Zoom meetings for a while, but we're here with Reverend Robert Emmerich. Reverend Bob, thank you so much. My pleasure. Tell me a little bit about yourself for anyone who hasn't encountered you in their day-to-day life in Bay Ridge. Well, let's see. I grew up in a town of 250 people in the Appalachian Mountains, and I came up to New York City to go to seminary and never went back. So I've been in serving churches in New York City, and then along the way, I got an LCSW, and I was running a mental health center and doing wow. counseling and supervision, and I taught psychology for a little while as an adjunct, and I was in New Jersey doing clinical social work when I got an invitation to preach in Bay Ridge. Don't know where that came from, but that was in 2004, and I've been here ever since. And my mandatory retirement date is June 30th. Now, I like to tell the congregation, religion is the one area of life where any and all forms of discrimination may find safe haven. So the policy of my denomination is the June after your 72nd birthday, you are retired. Huh. Now, that's a form of discrimination. It's like saying, okay, from now on, you got nothing to say. But in religion, anything goes. All forms of discrimination are well protected. And uh, I'm experiencing that. Now, mine isn't nearly as severe as others, but it does have an impact. It's like, oh, you're done. Well, not today. (laughs) Not today. Not today. But so that's basically the overview. I have a daughter and a son in law and a grandson and a granddaughter on the way and Oh wow, congratulations. Yes, so I'm 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 doing okay. (laughs) Well, three years ago you wrote a book, Finding Solid Ground, which I have a copyright here thoroughly annotated and noted. 
which I found a really interesting play of the economy, religion, as well as personal reflections on your time in Bay Ridge. I don't think I could have come to any of the insights that I relate in solid ground if I had not come to Bay Ridge. I mean, all my life I've had questions and concerns and doubts, but I couldn't quite crystallize what they were. When I was a kid, I knew I was going to be a minister. But one of my earliest questions was, how can people who say they're Christian, church-going folk also be racist? Mm -hmm. That just didn't make any sense to me. I never got an answer until I came to Bay Ridge. It's a complicated story, but when I was invited to be a guest speaker here in October of 2004, I was invited to come back and speak in December, and then eventually they asked me to be the pastor here. But I wanted to come here because the congregation was willing to let go of its building in order to do ministry. That's so interesting. Yeah. I had never seen that before. That was one of the reasons you came. Yes, that was the main reason, that the congregation was willing to consider that. The numbers had dwindled, as they have in most Protestant churches and Catholic. We had to rent space, gladly, to heart share, to pay the operational budget. But one day, the building would have needed, it was a big building, it would have needed a new roof. Mm. And that would have been out of reach. That's big money. So the congregation realized that we were cash poor, but land rich. In other mm -hmm. words, they were actually sitting on their assets, if you will. <laughs> and so they entered a decision that was unanimously made in March of 05 to sell the property, to build a smaller church building, solar mm -hmm. powered, on the property, but to use the proceeds then to remain in operation regardless of the numbers fluctuation. In other words, to have enough money to keep going and to do the things that Jesus said his followers should do, like care for the poor and do it with love. It was a clear, unanimous decision. But then there was tremendous opposition from some segments of the community, yeah. some secular folk, but also some church folk. And there was just one or two churches that defended the decision. So that made me wonder, how is it possible that it isn't perfectly clear in people's minds that churches have an obligation to use their resources to do what Jesus said? This is the Green Church, if anyone doesn't know it or you're new to the neighborhood. It used to stand on Ovington and Fourth Avenue. It was crumbling away. You invited people to go and take a sample of the stone. You could reach out, and it crumbled in your hand. It was falling. There had to be scaffolding and netting to keep it from hurting people nearby. And the New York Times quoted you saying, Are we here to pour all of our money into stone, or do we have a bigger mission in the world? Right. The opposition at the time, journalists and local community leaders, were trying all these ways and suggesting to you and your congregation how you should do it. Right. There were proposals about how we could use the land in order to generate funds, but all those proposals were based on the notion that all of that money would go into preserving stone. Yeah. It became clear to me that that's not our mission. Jesus never said anything about preserving buildings. I am a historic preservationist by training, and Either you take an incredibly expensive thing and you go right. the interior and preserve the exterior, but then it doesn't maintain character. What are you trying to preserve? There are so many questions about yeah. preservation that it seems like we're not made at that time. Because I was asking myself the same question. What if the congregation's wrong? And I asked myself that question seriously. So the only way I could sort of resolve it for myself was to go and reread what Jesus said in the four Gospels, the things that were attributed to him as having said. Because for me, the church is a special case in that we are here in Jesus' name, and therefore we ought to do what he said. It's that simple. Our mission in the world has to be defined by what Jesus said, not by our traditions. And that means that church buildings are things that come and go. 
there weren't any church buildings at all until in the 300s when Constantine started to build church buildings. For the first 300 years, the churches met in people's homes. Did that for 300 years. But when Constantine sort of took over, he took public funds and built church buildings and put the clergy as senators' robes. The church was already off the track, but it went completely off the track at that point. That was a rationale that was clear in my mind that I learned from the conflict here in Bay Ridge. There is a definition for the church that supersedes church traditions. Christianity is entering its third millennium. Now might be a good time to think about what our founder intended. For so many people, that thing with the green church, that's the end. They stopped paying attention. It's now a school. It's yeah. lovely. But for us, that's really the start of this story. Right. And the outcome thus far is that we don't have a new building. And my feeling is that's probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. We rent space here at Good Shepherd in a beautiful room. Yes. But because of that action with the property, we have enough money to live on such that we give away our Sunday offerings. We have a mission committee that does research. We've given money to everything from the local ambulance to Doctors Without Borders. We give away all of our Sunday offerings. We don't need it to pay the light bill. So people are really enjoying, if that's the right word, figuring out the best way to give away this money that we get on Sundays. That's amazing. <laughs> like you, it's, it's, it's almost refreshingly shocking to hear. That, yeah. <laughs> like it's given away. Yeah, we all give of it. all of it. On top of that, if anyone doesn't know you from the Green Church, a few years after that, a half-page ad in the Times. Yes, that's the second thing that caught my attention. If we're here to do what Jesus said we should do, that is, to care for one another, how can we do that? Because at that time, there was the beginning of the campaign for the Obama second term, and I was hearing all kinds of things being said about the economy. Mm. Who are the job creators, and what's this, and what's that? And I went to college. I had micro and macro economics. I didn't know enough to know if anyone was telling the truth. So I started to do my own research. I looked at seven or eight economic indicators since the end of the Revolutionary War, to the extent that data were available. And I just made long sheets of data, and then I did the math to come up with annual averages for each of these indicators. And I discovered that what was being said in the campaign by both sides to a certain extent was false, that actually the most productive period for the U.S. economy was during the Great Depression. Works Progress Administration, New Deal. It actually worked. That was the period of the greatest growth in the economy. It worked. And after World War II, the economy did very, very well with the record number of federal employees. Eisenhower makes AOC look like a moderate. His taxes were far higher than anything that anyone would dare to recommend, and yet that's what built the federal interstate highway system, Yeah, plus the GI Bill. All of those things created the most successful economy the country has ever had. And then after that, there was a move toward what's been called supply-side or trickle-down economics, mm -hmm. and the economy has done consistently worse since 1972. Learning that, my question is, why are people saying what they're saying? If I can find these things out, about a year's worth of research in the mornings from four to eight. So then I brought this to the congregation's attention. And so it seems to me like the thing a church could do would be to say, we have these two different sets of data, one pre-1972, one after how come there's such a big difference in the economy's performance? We were offering a prize of $33,000 to economists or a group of economists who could come up with an answer to that. The approach was, let's figure out what we were doing right, and let's experiment to see if that might work again. 
And in a simple, easy laid out format, there's a PBS piece explaining all this. We'll have that in the show notes. What's yeah. amazing is how much the congregation wanted these answers. They were willing to dip into the capital because this would be a service to everybody. And let's experiment with policies to see what might work versus assuming that trickle down has to be the way of life forever. In most fields, including economics, we don't know as much as we think we do. Hmm. And there's a lot to learn in applying economic knowledge to public policy. But to me, that was perfectly in line with Jesus' teaching. Let's use systems to bring about human well-being. If we fail, we fail, but let's try. So they went out in this ad in the Times, half page. We had one response, dollars and cents. They actually wrote a book about it. They came the closest, but then I asked them to, at the end of each chapter, to please put some bullet point policy implications. Mm, how to achieve it. They didn't do that. Ugh. So the money is still sitting there. <laughs> and, and that's with the congregation. So if anyone is listening to this now and thinks that it's been taken, it's, it's still not, wide it's open. It's still wide open. <laughs> and to me, it's the only sensible approach to economic policy. Let's figure out what worked to produce human well-being. Now, yeah, granted, there was racial and gender discrimination during that period of time. Yeah. But the principles proved that they could be successful the public and the private needing each other to make a successful economy. The people who say small government is good don't know what they're talking about. Which is what you call the heart of the economy in the book. Right. That there must be a balance between public spending and private spending. Yeah, that Minsky showed that there's no such thing as a stable stock market and that public demand through public funds is at least a foundation for aggregate demand. So even while we're looking at the invisible hand, we can do a policy visible hand. But anyway, all of this for me was stuff that the church should always be doing. All churches everywhere should be involved in trying to help people figure out what's the best way to live the most humane life that we can. So that's another thing I learned while I was thinking about what Jesus said Let's use all of our capacities, institutional, educational, money. Why don't we try to build a better world? You mentioned that before the Green Church was taken down, you were trying to make ends meet by having heart share, share the building. Many churches have nonprofits yes. and others that occupy those spaces and help with that money and that exactly. rent keep their missions going. That's a great right. example of the balance that's needed. Yes, that's something we could do intentionally. I mean, I think a lot of it was sort of forced on churches, but I think it turns out to be a great idea that churches become civic centers as well. That goes to the next stage of this, which is before I started the podcast, I was a member of Fight Back Bay Ridge. There's an episode on the origins of that if anyone wants to go listen. After um, Sally and everyone kind of founded it in their apartments, I remember coming up here to this space that we're sitting in now and meeting other progressives. We had to have a little circle of chairs mm -hmm. and you provided a space that acted almost as a community space for, I think, a good number of people. And that's a continuation yes. of that exact story. Exactly. Most churches have space, and I think, why not use it to try to do some of the things that Jesus said we are good to do, that it's good to make life better if we can? Why not use church space to let community groups meet and try to do that? To me, it's just a no-brainer. Yeah, why are we here? Are we here just to have services and stuff, or are we here to make the world a better place? Yeah. Some of the things that were discussed in this room, voter discounts at local businesses, trash pickup around the holidays in neighborhoods that are not Bay Ridge, composting programs, demanding answers from politicians going back to when you first were trying to investigate why so many politicians were lying or just incorrect. There was a voter education guide subgroup that I was a part of that sat just over to the left there, just trying to figure out what yeah. politicians were saying and what yeah. their actual 
policies were, but those were the kind of things that this space yeah. enabled. See, I think my experience with a lot of different groups over these past 50 years is that there are some good folks and some bad folks in every group. And by good, I mean they're people of goodwill. They don't want to hurt anyone, and they want to try to help if they can. No two people have exactly the same ideas about how to do that. But there are people of goodwill in every group. Also, there are people of ill will. My sense in every community I've been part of, my first church was in central Harlem. And from then, I moved to Manhattan Valley, where we did housing development, economic development. And then I was in Staten Island for a while. And then I went into social work school. But I found the same thing here in Bay Ridge, that there are good folk. And I sense that a lot of people want to see things change for the better. Maybe goodwill is strong enough to allow people to question their thinking. And to me, that's the importance of what I call this humane pragmatism. Instead of speculating about what should work or shouldn't work, let's do things that might work in which people don't get hurt. So it seems to me that churches are a space that can open up to people of goodwill who might actually want to consider issues in an atmosphere of goodwill. Doesn't sound like it has any chance of succeeding, but if we don't do that, what are we doing? Have you seen that in Bay Ridge since you've gotten here? Has it gotten better? Has it gotten worse? Well, I've seen more dialogue, say, in the religious sphere with some Muslims and Christians and Jews as well. I've seen some, there's more of that that I've seen. And people got to meet each other as individuals. Mm. And the idea there is if you see somebody on the street and they seem to be different, you met them somewhere in a gathering so that they're not a stranger, they're not to be feared. Anyway, not everyone's going to want to do this, but people of goodwill can find space, and I think churches ought to be the place where that's done. I don't have to agree with their philosophy because the truth is most people's philosophy hasn't really been thought about that much, and I include myself in that, but that's the point of having dialogue. You can also develop sympathy. Once people know what's happened to each other in their life, a lot of things make more sense. But even in terms of having facts available for discussion, that's part of what came out of the economic research that I did. To know, for example, for a fact that unemployment has been higher since we've had trickle down and unemployment was lowest consistently when we had higher government spending. I mean, there are always people who are going to deny that the earth is not flat. They're going to believe that it is. There's not much you can do there. But with people who are willing to consider facts or knowledge, or there is room for growth. There is room for development. And I, it just seems to me like churches would be a great forum for those kinds of conversations to occur. And you've done that. For Baird United Methodist, there's a running subcommittee, I think, still on the economy that stems off of that research. I would have loved to have been in the room when you came in that, after that year of research and you just told everyone, like... Well, I showed them all of my research. I was willing to spend hours explaining it. I wasn't expecting anyone to take my word for anything. Mm -hmm. Why should they? I, I presented information that any person could verify on their own, and I showed the math. It is possible to gain knowledge of facts. <laughs> as, as much as people nowadays might want to feel that that's a little hopeless, that people just lie, and they lie, and it seems like our day-to-day -day lives are confronting a series of lies that you just can't make stop. Right. And I think one of the tragedies I think I mentioned in the beginning of the Solid Ground book is that public discourse has become big business. A lot of money is tied up. And so the cynical part of me feels that maybe there's not such a great desire to resolve these conflicts because mm. a lot of people are making a lot of money on them. So why would you want to kill the goose that's laying your golden egg? 
by resolving a conflict, for example, with a discussion of what's actually in our tradition, in mm-hmm. our history. For Christians, to me, the valuable tradition is what Jesus taught, not debates about who he was. Likewise, in our civil discourse, civil with quotes, <laughs> we do have some common ground in our preamble and our constitution that states the reasons why the constitution was written. In other words, it says, in order to, da, 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 we hereby establish the purpose of the Constitution is to fulfill the goals in the preamble, which are very noble. I'm not ashamed of any of them. I would love to join a preamble party. <laughs> if there was one, I'd just sign me up. There are gems that we have in our traditions that can guide us now, except that I never learned these things in school. I didn't learn that the American political philosophy is already expressed in the preamble. That's why we exist. The preamble was the only political philosophy that was ever voted on by the people of the United States. To me, that's worth knowing. Yeah. (laughs) And, And that's where you go back to, like right now, you can learn a lot about the Supreme Court and how we interpret our laws and all of this. But it almost seems like people learn that to have these arguments online, they learn things as ammunition Mm -hmm. more than trying to find common ground with someone. Right. Just going back really quick, I feel like when you were mentioning so much of debate right now is big business, Twitter or Facebook or what have you, I just want to point out that the clear counterbalance to that is a space like this. I don't think there is any mistake that so much of progressive activism in Bay Ridge for the past four to five years has occurred in spaces like this. But again, going back then to the preamble, that is, on a meta level, the thing that we all agree on. I've heard some folks say that the United States is about people being able to worship freely and to get rich. Neither one of those is in the preamble. There's a balance of virtues, and they are all interdependent. So the people who think that the United States is only about individual liberty to do whatever you want, that's not there. And there is this thing called the general welfare, the common good. There's also justice and tranquility. All of these things that were voted on are the reasons we exist as a nation. You don't have to agree with that, but if you don't agree with that, then you're the one on whom the burden of proof lies. You have to be the one arguing for changing the Constitution's preamble. You mention in the book that all of them must be balanced. Right. One of the sages of 50 years ago was Mortimer Adler. He was professor of philosophy of law at the University of Chicago Law School. He wrote a book called The American Testament, and he makes the argument that each of the six purposes in the preamble are interdependent. For example, you cannot have tranquility if you don't have justice, and you can't have liberty unless you have the general welfare, that all of these things are interdependent. Some groups want to pull out one of those purposes and say it is supreme. No, they're not. You have to have them all. If you don't have them all, you don't really have any of them. There's a general notion here, it's implicit, that just as human beings have physical bodies, and we're a body of systems within our bodies, Mm -hmm. society is a body. You can't have a healthy society if the parts are not healthy and working together, the same as the body. You need a healthy cardiac, pancreas, whatever. They all have to be well-nourished, well-supported for the whole body. So yes, each individual is important. So is the social body that protects individuality. And then you can expand that to talk about the natural world that we live in. We're part of nature. That includes other living things. The planet that gives us our food, air, and water. People who said that Darwin said it's dog eat dog, kill or be killed. That's not what he said. He said it's about adaptation. And Darwin actually said in Descent of Man that the key to human survival is moral evolution. That means developing a sense of connection with all of the realities that we live in. What a concept. It's like we 
overlooked the most important discoveries in the last thousand years in order to establish a form of tribalism that's very selfish and self-destructive. There's a book I could recommend. It came out a few years ago called Why Nations Fail, Darren Asimoglu and, and somebody Robinson, that really documents the importance of understanding society as a body, that the institutions that we have need our support. Yes, schools cost money, but they also maintain the society as a whole. And if anything, we should be spending more. Sometimes we get short-term gain confused with long-term well-being. Yeah. But I think that's one of the benefits of looking in our traditions. For me, it's Jesus' teaching, but for all of us, it's the preamble. That's pure gold. And the more you think about it, the more it develops the mind and the heart to think that we're all actually parts of the same body. And we need to care for one another because that's how we care for ourselves as individuals. It's contrary to a lot of, well, some of these other fearful and selfish ideas make a lot of money for people. Yeah. Well, if we could redistribute some of that back. To, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> if you're going to argue and get angry online, we're just going to take all of that money that Google or Facebook is making yeah. and just put it back toward the things yeah. that don't make people yeah. upset. Just for that, you're going to have to pay for a teacher's salary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> March 1st, I was 72 years old. I finished 72 years. Coming to Bay Ridge was, for me, a key part of my intellectual and spiritual development because mm. of what I encountered here. It enabled the writing of the Solid Ground book. I had written a book about the soul that came out in 2010, and I thought mm -hmm. that was the end of it. <laughs> but then this one came up. So I'm going to be writing another book, which I hope will be the last, <laughs> Jesus Teaching and Real Life. I just want to try to sketch out some ways in which I think his teaching, which is universalizable, he says the way to get justice and goodness and all of these things is through love. Mm. Not the selfish, possessive kind, but the kind that cares about another's well-being. Yeah. That that's the best path to accomplish what we want to do for our children and ourselves and on into the future. Jesus teachings implications for understanding ourselves, the society we live in, our politics and economy, and spirituality. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do a sketchbook because I haven't been able to find a book that talks about Jesus' teaching applied to real life in a sort of comprehensive way. And I issued my $50 challenge to the congregation. If you can find a book that talks about Jesus' teaching applied to the various dimensions of life, I'll give you $50 U.S. <laughs> That's my standing challenge. All right. And let's, I, I, I feel like it might stand for as long as the other one. You guys have to act quick because Reverend Bob is going to be out in a little bit. But Reverend Bob, thank you so much for being a member of Bay Ridge, a member of the community. I know a good number of people owe you in a way. They'll remember you fondly. I don't think you'll ever be forgotten. Wow. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of the community. That means a lot to me to hear that because that's how I feel about you folks too. And any person of goodwill, they need to find each other in the world and be together and work together. Yeah. And it's been my privilege to be here, and I thank you for this opportunity, Dan. Oh, it's been Bay Ridge's <laughs> privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, that was really something. That was a really interesting interview. I'm really glad that you and Reverend Bob were able to sit down and do it. I'm so glad, too. That was a day before Fight Back Bay Ridge actually had a celebratory going away party with a cake and oh my God, all what kinds a cake. of stuff. Terry, oh. your cake was amazing. <laughs> It was also just very relieving to do an episode live again yeah. um, in person. That felt so nice. And it, it brings out such beautiful moments that, you know, as much as we love Zoom is not quite the same. <laughs> do we love Zoom? Love in quotes. But no, I mean, there were some really amazing lines in there. I think my favorite one was, was it Eisenhower makes AOC look like, like a, a moderate? moderate. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh. 
Love there, it. There's so much in how Reverend Bob has written that book mm-hmm. that just like screams Bernie Sanders to me. So <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad that we had him speak so candidly and just so eloquently about some of the things that he's seen in Bay Ridge for these last few years. He has such an incredible spirit of generosity. And something we asked the community to do, which you'll be hearing in a moment, is just a few members of Fight Back Bay Ridge who wanted to put their thoughts and memories and hopes for his future and how much he's meant to us here in Bay Ridge. And Dan, I think you and I both had a couple of things we wanted to say about that. Do you want to go ahead? Well, number one, I want to give Reverend Bob the Fight Back Bay Ridge Perfect Attendance Award as he was <laughs> always... Probably the the only one. (laughs) Yeah, I think the only one. He was the one that was at every single one of those meetings. Bob, thank you so much for the decisions you made in this community. I'm sorry that some of it was contentious. I'm so glad that you had the space of mind to question whether or not you were wrong and question yourself, but not in a way that led you to change that decision, but in a way that Mm. led you to strengthen your belief in the decisions that you and your congregation made and for your decision to even The thing that floored me the most in that interview was that you came here because Mm. that congregation wanted to do that. That decision was so brave. I remember when that church went down, I was upset Mm -hmm. because I didn't really know that story. And that has made me reframe some of my beliefs that I had at that time. And I believe that I was wrong to be so against that church going down because Now my niece goes to that school, Mm -hmm. which wouldn't have been a thing, and Fight Back Bay Ridge would not have had that beautiful space. Mm -hmm. And I really love that everything you did has enabled so many others in the neighborhood. Kind of off what you just said about Bob's generosity and that space really making a difference. Yes, at the neighborhood level, also at a very personal level for a lot of us who are in Fight Back Bay Ridge. And personally, I just want to thank Bob because had he not been generous enough to give us that space, had Fight Back Bay Ridge not had the benefit of it, a lot of our lives would be very different right now. I mean, me personally, I was a fashion copywriter when I first moved to Bay Ridge. And getting involved there was kind of my first experience with formal organizing, electoral organizing. And obviously, since then, I've gone full on into politics. (laughs) I'm going to try to distribute some of Reverend Bob's Finding Solid Ground books to Mm. some of the little libraries, the open little libraries in the neighborhood. If you walk by one, open it up, you might find a book there. He did not write those to make money. Mm -hmm. So I feel like... 50 copies a year. (laughs) Yeah, he (laughs) sells exactly 50 copies a year, no more, no less, he said. So, yeah, I can't think of a better way than to have those available for free to the community through those little free libraries. Unless perhaps it is by listening to all of our friends and fellow organizers sharing their memories. Yes, listen after the end music rolls in the episode, especially Bob, if you're listening. Stick around after that music because there are some people that want to say something. So until next time, everyone, follow us on Twitter at at Radio Free BR, on Facebook, on the web at RadioFreeBayRidge.org. Instagram, Twitter is always a more salty version of the podcast. Oh, uh, if, you, if you feel like you need an extra helping of us having opinions, go that way. Two extra helpings. <laughs> Until next time, everyone. Stay free, Bay Ridge. Hi, I'm Stephen Pickering and a member of Fight Back Bay Ridge since 2017. When I think of Reverend Bob, the word sanctuary comes to mind. Truly, there are many kinds of sanctuary, and I can say with enormous gratitude that Reverend Bob provided that for me and many others in the wake of the Trump election, where we were suddenly looking to organize locally from house to house, block to block, and neighborhood to neighborhood. Reverend Bob opened his church space to us so that we could gather to build community and create the change that we envisioned. What was so beautiful is that his gentle spirit and advice guided and centered us. We came from many different backgrounds and ideologies, yet we were absolutely united in the actions of our group. From asking corrupt state senators to helping clean the streets of Diker Heights, from community-led congressional town halls to green market composting, reusable bag initiatives, Reverend Bob gave us sanctuary. Thank you for all you have given us and Bay Ridge. And apologies for the occasional salty language we dropped in the space. We were pretty fired up. Thank you for your grace. Reverend Bob, we wish you much love and joy in your next stop, and we will not forget you. Hi, Reverend Bob. This is Jay Brown. I just wanted to thank you very much for 
all the years uh, where you meant so much to all of us who participated in Fight Back Bay Ridge, um, are we providing us a safe space to organize and just a space in general when sometimes, you know, a group of people who are trying to get involved and try to start something, you know, that sometimes it's the hardest thing to find a place where everyone can convene together and assemble and, you know, work things out and figure out how they can help the community. And you always play such a big part in that. Um, and I, I always appreciated, you know, your words when we would meet because you weren't just there providing us the space. You were kind of giving us um, some wisdom, some great input, uh, and you were participating. And, you know, you were always valued in terms of what you brought to the discussion and the ideas you brought. And I just appreciate what you did for us, what you've done for your congregation there uh, and the community at large. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best in the future. Hi, Bob. This is Mallory. And this is Alan. And we're just really sorry to see you leaving Bay Ridge, but so happy for you that you get to retire and spend more time with your grandkids. I mean, Bob, you were instrumental to Fight Back Bay Ridge. You were such a central and level force, and you injected a real sense of calm (laughs) to the proceedings, which were very, very helpful often. Yeah, and especially, you know, you've been our home for a lot of the last four years after we very quickly outgrew Sally's apartment and we were looking for a place to meet. We thought we would be finding places that were temporary, at least at first, but we didn't. We found a place with you that nobody ever wanted to leave or see end. Yeah, and and the fact that you were so generous with your time and so flexible with what we wanted to do was truly a gift. So to put it mildly, you will be missed. Yeah. And thank you so much for everything. I met Bob about five years ago now. It was at his church for a fight back meeting. My first meeting, actually. Can't remember the action we were working on at the time, but somehow in the discussion, I must have said something that just made my faith obvious. Because after the meeting, Bob came up to me, uh, and it was our first conversation, and he asked me if I was a person of faith. He said he could hear the teachings of Jesus in my comments. And we had a discussion about faith and how that led me to my activism and how it influenced all my views on social justice and our duties as humans and as as Christians. And that was the beginning of a really fast and authentic friendship and deep respect for one another. Since then, Bob has become my mentor, my friend, my family, my teacher, my therapist, and really just one of my biggest cheerleaders in life. I am grateful to God every day for putting him into my life, and my children and I love him dearly. Bob, I am a better human because you came into my life. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for loving me so unconditionally. And we're going to miss having you around here in Brooklyn, but I know you will always be in our lives. Love you.